Hello, and welcome to episode 31 of the Witcher chapter by chapter book review, where I'll go through a summary of what happened in the latest chapter and give my detailed thoughts on it. Today, I'm discussing chapter three from Baptism of Fire. I don't have to actually read off of my notes anymore. And yes, I do have that written down in my notes so that I don't mess it up. I don't have to read off my notes anymore to say that. 31 episodes in and I now have it memorized. But I'm leaving it in the notes just in case. Because the second I take it out of the notes is the second I'm going to forget. So that's your update on my intro. (laughs) You got your intro update for the week. Okay. So we're going to talk about chapter three. I already know. I I don't have a whole lot to say about it. It really isn't the most eventful of chapters. There is one cool thing that happens. I won't jump ahead because we're going to talk about it in a minute. But aside from that, not a whole lot to say. Some stuff. But yeah, I imagine that this is going to be kind of a short episode. But it's currently nighttime that I'm recording this. And I, uh, I do occasionally record at night, but I try to not go too late into the night because I end up feeling a little bit wired by the time I'm done. And it's hard to fall asleep because <laughs> I already suck at sleeping enough as it is. And I would really like to avoid anything that would keep me up later. But I actually just got done streaming on Twitch right before uh, re- starting to record this. So I was already in that mode of talking to a camera kind of I was talking to the chat also so a little bit different because right now I'm just recording but still I was talking like I'm not when I'm talking to the chat I'm just I'm looking at a camera and talking just like I'm doing now and talking into the microphone so basically I felt like now would be a good time because I I, I don't always feel ready to record I definitely have to be in a certain mood I, I, I can't do it, which is whenever. Like, uh, for example, when I first started streaming, I was doing it early in the morning, like when I first woke up so I could do it before I had to start work. And I had to stop doing that because I just was, uh, I was not ready for that. Especially if people were talking to me in the chat. It was really hard to uh, have a conversation and also pay attention to what I was doing in the game, which is already kind of a balance any time of the day. But it was definitely not easy first thing in the morning. And I had my coffee with me and everything too. But it's like I I hadn't spoke to another person yet. And (laughs) it just wasn't, it wasn't a good time. So I had to push it back to later on. But yeah, that's basically another update about something you probably didn't care about. You're here for The Witcher. So let's talk about that. (laughs) All right. So I'm going to give you the recap of the previous chapter and then we'll summarize what happened in this chapter and then we're going to talk about it. So for the recap, while on their journey to rescue Ciri, Geralt and Dandelion are mistaken by hawkers as elves. The Nilfgaardians and hawkers get killed with the help of Milva, who finally caught up with the Witcher and Bard. The prisoner was Cahir and Geralt threatened that if he saw him again, he'd kill him. Milva joins them on their journey and they later discover Cahir has been following them. He explains he needs to help them find Ciri, but Geralt isn't interested in allowing that or in sparing his life, but Cahir takes off before Geralt kills him. After passing through the wreckage of battles and destruction, the trio join a group of dwarves escorting women and children. They learn from Zoltan, the group's leader, that to avoid getting caught in the wrong hands, they need to go even further around than they already have to reach Ciri. Later, they save a young woman from a band of marauders while one is able to escape, but only for a moment when he runs into the woods and is killed by Kahir, who is still following them. Okay, here's the summary of chapter three. Shortly after the events of chapter two, Kahir's riderless horse catches up with the group and they see bloodstains on its saddlecloth, which must mean the former knight has been somehow killed. They carry on with his horse, but unfortunately lose their wagon when it falls into the bottom of a ravine and breaks apart. Zoltan sends some of the dwarves off to bury their secret treasures, but the rest of the group continues on. They come across an old elven burial ground where they decide to spend the night, although they're afraid of ghouls after they witness corpses recently devoured by the flesh-eating monsters. They all become very frightened when they spot a being attempting to hide in some nearby rocks. Geralt approaches it, but it's only a man. The man introduces himself as Emil Regis and invites them to his quaint summer residence for the night. At his home, everyone but Regis, who doesn't drink, indulges in his moonshine made from mandrake and has a merry time. 
After getting an update on the state of the war and the areas that are impacted, Regis agrees to join the party on their journey. Meanwhile, Siri and the rats attend a party in a barn where she and Iskra dance to loud music on a table, just like in Geralt's dream he disclosed the details of to Milva last chapter. Well, that part's pretty interesting. I'll talk about that towards the end because that was at the end of the chapter and I like to go in order. Uh, Although there's not really a whole lot to say about that there, but we'll see. (laughs) We'll see how that goes. But let's start talking about Kahir's death. So, you know, but basically what happens to provide a little bit more context than I did in the summary, Kahir's horse catches up to the group by itself and they discover blood on its saddlecloth. The blood, however, could have actually come from its previous rider during the fight with the hawkers or it could be Kahir's blood. Uh, there's just absolutely no way for them to know that, of course. And that's um, I, I actually didn't even think about that when he had a horse, like in the second chapter when he showed up, like when he caught up to Milva and Geralt and Dandelion. Uh, I didn't think about where he got the horse from, but that makes sense that he got it from one of the Nilf guardians or hawkers from that fight. But uh, basically, that's how they're not 100% sure on what has happened with him because it might not have been his blood. But it doesn't really seem likely that he'd still be alive because why would his horse just show up without him so this actually has the group worried at first because they don't know if whoever removed kahir from his saddle is still following them like they don't know if the person that killed kahir was an enemy to just kahir or if this was a bad person that's also after them or or what's going on so it's kind of scary for the group Geralt, however isn't really too afraid uh what, this, what could have happened because he thinks that whoever it was that killed Kahir probably recognized that he was a Nilf Guardian, even though he has <laughs> said he's not a Nilf Guardian. But he thinks that because Kahir talked with a little bit of a Nilf Guardian accent, they might have recognized that and then killed him because he's the enemy. And also, he was alone, so that would have been pretty easy to kill him. But that's we just don't know what the circumstances were. And the whole chapter continues without any further context into uh, what could have happened, or we don't get any proof from, we don't get any proof into what actually happened to Kahir. So it all works out though, uh, not to sound super dismissive of his death because he actually could have been a good guy, but it does work out for the group because they get a new horse and that's, a nice thing for them to have because at first Zoltan rides it for a little bit and then they put a couple of the kids that they're escorting on it. Uh, it doesn't really help them too much as far as quickening their pace on their journey goes because the there's not enough horses for everybody and the two women, or I think it's only two women, I just said two and as I said that I, I realized I don't know that it's actually two. The women that they're escorting cannot keep up. They, they just can't walk fast enough, which I think is probably pretty understandable. Um, when you compare them to everybody else in that party. Like, Geralt's a witcher. Don't really need to explain why he's got really good stamina. Uh, the dwarves, uh, Percival, the gnome, they've made it pretty clear that they're pretty hardy. They can, uh, they're pretty um, exceptional, uh, physically speaking. Milva is a hunter. She lives outdoors. Dandelion travels around a lot. So I think everybody else probably has above average stamina. And then these women probably have what the typical person does. Like probably the same as what I would have. So I don't think I would be able to keep up with this group either. But either way, it's still nice that they have this extra horse. It's just a shame though that we'll never be able to understand why Kahir continued to follow the group and why he said that he must help them find Siri. Because when he was still alive, When we could have found out about that, Geralt didn't want to get those details. And I wish that he did because it's too late now. But anyway, I'll move on from that as quickly as they did in the chapter. (laughs) Poor guy. So we get a little bit of more developments on the war. So it looks like Temeria is now on the offense, which we don't see too much proof of. It's a more so speculation, but it's probably the case. So we believe that this is what's going on, that Temeria is now attacking Nilfgaard or defending themselves against Nilfgaard because they come across a tree, the group comes across a tree at some point, and it's got bodies hanging from it. And most of the bodies have signs on them that say things like traitor, collaborator, elven narc, Nilfgaardian whore, obviously things that would not 
be done by no elf guardians and because they're i don't know if they're still in brugge or if they are within like the actual like country limits of temeria but even if they are in brugge it's still it's being it's a uh what's the word protectorate i don't know if that's that sounds right but i'm not sure uh it, it basically um king fault test the king of temeria is in charge of Brugge, so he would be the one to uh, send an army to defend that area so with this development the group feels safer thinking the temerian army are now between them and nilfgaard and there's smoke ahead of them but Zoltan argues that the smoke is probably Temeria torching villages who help Squiatel. So he doesn't, he's pretty optimistic about this. He doesn't think that the smoke ahead of them is going to be Nilfgaard burning more villages. But this is another thing that's, they're not certain about. There's no way of knowing. I think that's just going to be a normal thing that's going to come up a decent amount that they're, they're not going to know of a lot of things while they're traveling on the road during a, a bad war but there's yeah you know, there's just not any way for them to know if the smoke ahead of them is caused by Temerian soldiers or an elf guardian soldiers so they decide that they're going to move into the woods they're going to start traveling through the forest and get off the highway because they were being a little bit risky and traveling on the highway for a period of time so they are a little bit reluctant to go into the woods though because they are looking at this tree with the corpses on it and Geralt points out that one or maybe a few of the bodies, I don't remember, uh, or I don't know if it specifies, but they were raked by ghoul talons. So he tells them there's probably ghouls nearby and that definitely gives them pause that Zoltan's pretty freaked out by that. But Milva actually says that uh, she prefers, she would rather go into the woods because she prefers ghouls to humans. And I get that <laughs> considering everything that they've seen so far. Yeah, I definitely understand that. But luckily, at least to up to where the chapter ended, they didn't run into any ghouls. So I, hopefully that doesn't happen in the next chapter. But And I don't know if they're going to go back into the woods next chapter. But sorry, I'm jumping ahead. So anyway, I was thinking about King Foltest when it came to the little updates that we got on the war here. I'm thinking that he is probably feeling pretty foolish. We don't obviously... We obviously do not see what is going on in his brain. We don't get any perspective from his current setting. But we know that he signed a neutrality pact with Nilfgaard because he believed it would bring them peace. And that didn't happen. I think that that was very obvious it wasn't going to happen. And I think that that was so stupid of him (laughs) to not see this coming. Or if he did see it coming, maybe he just thought that that would give them a little bit of time. I doubt it though. I think that he was just being stupid. He signed that neutrality pact and now Nilfgaard has already done so much damage. So even if they can successfully fight back, if Tamaria can successfully fight back, they've already done so much. Like they've killed so many innocent people, burned down so many villages, villages that probably uh, provide certain things, goods, services, resources to the state. And yeah, that, that could have been avoided if he just began his offensive when they um, attacked Adern and Lyria. Like, they were supposed to because they were allied. <laughs> so, yeah, I think he just didn't think that they were going to win if he did not agree to be neutral. But it's just the chance of them winning now are way less likely. So... Uh, I mean, what can you say? Maybe sometime we'll get to see his perspective on what's going on and see him full of regret, or maybe there was some strategy behind it. I doubt it, though. But for now, I think full test is stupid. (laughs) All right. So let's talk a little bit about Regis, because he's a new character, and it looks like he's going to be around for I don't know how long, but it looks like he will be returning because he's going to be joining the group. So... Basically, how we get to this point to flesh out a little bit more details before I start going into what we know about him so far. So they accidentally drop their Vera wagon into a ravine and it gets smashed to bits. And some of the contents of the wagon were concealed in chests. Zoltan orders, uh, I think it was three of the dwarves to remain behind and bury the chests. So the those dwarves are not going to be present for the rest of the chapter 
don't know if that's super important for you to know if you didn't already know that, but I <laughs> just wanted to make sure that I added in that little detail. So the group without those three dwarves moves on to this place that's called Fen Karn. It's the elven cemetery where they meet Regis. So Regis discloses that he's a barber surgeon. He's also an herbalist and an alchemist, which I think the herbalist and alchemist uh, jobs are probably just supplemental to the barber surgeon profession um, because he collects herbs to distill medicines and elixirs. So he actually has some of these herbs on him when they meet, and he smelled so strongly of them, the herbs and the spices, that when they got close to the horses, the horses got really fussy because he smelled so strongly. (laughs) So he seems like a really nice guy. He seems very smart. He's got a lot of knowledge about some quite obscure things. He knew that the graveyard would not contain ghouls, while everybody else was actually afraid that there could be ghouls there. So I'm not saying that that makes him a super intelligent, but the fact that everybody else thought that that was a possibility and Regis just immediately knew, like, nope, you don't got to worry about ghouls here. The All the bodies that were buried here were buried a long time ago. Like, ghouls are not going after them. Uh, that's just, I don't know. I that could be common knowledge and everybody else was just stupid. I kind of thought it was weird that Geralt didn't, I, Geralt should know that, but he didn't speak up. Just I'm being a little bit pedantic about that here, but <laughs> it's not that important. I just thought that that was a little bit strange that Geralt didn't ease everybody's worries before Regis did and say, um, no, there's not going to be ghouls here, but I don't know. Maybe he was just thinking uh, anything's possible and he's been on the road for a while. So and he's seen a lot of terrible things. I, mean, I should, I should, I should lighten up on Carol. I shouldn't be too harsh. So anyway, uh, another example is that uh, Regis could tell by the smell of Geralt's sweat that his injuries were treated with magic, and because he was able to walk already, and with a few other subtle details, he must have been healed in Broccolon. I understand that Regis is a medical professional. This isn't too far off from his expertise, but still, like those details were so small. And he could just smell his sweat and figure that out. That was pretty impressive. So yeah, Regis is a smart guy. Even there's even a one point where he's using certain words and he has to dumb it down a little bit because I think it was Zoltan who didn't it was either Zoltan or Percival, uh, who didn't know what he was talking about because uh, he he speaks very eloquently. It might actually have been I don't remember never mind, never mind. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, he's uh, he's very intelligent, and uh, they say that he's described he's described as looking about like middle aged. So it's not like he's a young man. Maybe he's had plenty of time to learn a lot of things. But he is also he seems very very nice. So he, it doesn't it doesn't appear to be a person that's going to be bringing down the group. I think he'll probably be pleasant to have around for them. Uh, He'll probably be in, an enjoyable character to con- to continue to read about in upcoming chapters. Well, depending on how long we get him for. But uh, all these characters actually so far are pretty likable. I do like reading about uh, Zoltan and Percival. We haven't really gotten to know the other dwarves that well. They kind of just brush over them. But uh, Milva has still been pretty cool. She gets pretty sassy with Dandelion a lot. And you see it a lot in this chapter. And it's really entertaining. Uh, I do still like her. Uh, She's not as as nice as Regis is, I would say, but she's still very likable. And and she's she's a character that you definitely enjoy reading about. So the dwarves, we learn a little bit more about them. I don't know that a lot of this information is super pertinent to the story. I think that it could possibly come up again at some point. But either way, I think it's always nice to just give a little bit of an explanation into some of the things that we get to learn about the world. Because, I, and I think I've said this like a long time ago, but this isn't our world. <laughs> this is a different world where things are not going to be the same. So it's nice for us to uh, explore the details that we get a little bit. So that's what I'm about to do, just to give you some idea of what point I'm making when I'm going through this. So anyway, (laughs) to jump into that. So while they're at Regis's place, while everyone's drinking this mandrake moonshine, they're talking a lot, they get super chatty and we learn a little bit about dwarven politics and society. So some of the noteworthy things that I jotted down, Nilfgaard apparently would never attack Mahakam. And I discussed Mahakam last episode. 
that is where mostly dwarves live. There's this Mount Carbon there that they forge all the weapons. Uh, the Nilfgaard would never attack them because they also, just like all the other northern countries do, they also rely on the dwarves in that area for weapons. And everybody knows that if they were to attack them, they would just flood the mines and wreck the workshops. And then nobody would have access to those weapons anymore. So another thing, Zoltan explains dwarven solidarity a little bit. So dwarves can integrate themselves in human societies better than elves can because they have a high sense of clansmanship. So they can make themselves at home wherever their clan is. But elves are actually more focused on land and territory. So as long as they're together, they're home. But with the elves, that's not the case. And that makes a lot of sense considering the little bit of history that we've gotten on the elves so far. Like, I think it was back in the Edge of the World short story. I mean, I do know that's where we met Philivandra, but I think that's where we got a good idea into why the elves, why a lot of them have a hard time integrating in human societies. I think now that they mention it, I, what I... What I'm picturing is that a lot of the cities, a lot of the human societies probably have more dwarves than they have elves, especially nowadays with the Scoia'tael and everything. But yeah, I think that that makes sense. And it's nice to get a little bit more insight into what's going on there. And we also get to even learn about some of the updates to the dwarven societies and to dwarven politics, like when... uh, Regis and Zoltan are talking about how the Hackham's ruler has actually stopped allowing young dwarves to join Scoia'tael. And apparently that has led to fewer pogroms against dwarves as people are not feeling as much animosity towards them anymore, which is a good thing, of course. I mean, I think that they should be able to do what they want, of course. I think they should be able to do what they want, but I also um, think that that's nice that the innocent dwarves that are living in these human societies aren't (laughs) getting killed as often because the humans just get pissed about the dwarves that are in these Scoia'tael commandos and hurting people. So those were just a couple of little things that I thought I would mention uh, since we learned about them in this chapter. But moving on to (laughs) Ciri in the barn, not not really a whole lot to say. Uh, It was exactly like Geralt's dream that he had in the last chapter that he talked about in the last chapter. So his dreams are definitely prophetic. We already knew that the one dream that he continued to have where she was uh, riding through the village with the rest of the rats and she was holding hands, he said, with a cropped haired girl. We know that that was Missile. Uh, We knew that that one was definitely happening, but the one that he described in the last chapter with her dancing in the barn, we weren't totally sure about that. But But it was safe to assume that that was real, but now we know for sure that it was. So, I mean, it's good to know she's having fun with them and she's getting along with them really well because I remember Iskra, because her and Iskra were dancing together a lot and they were, the, the two of them were having such a good time together. So Iskra was actually pretty rude to Siri at first when they met and I think she was the meanest out of all of them. Well, Kaylee was kind of horrible, but I think he's just all around horrible. But Iskra was pointedly being rude to Siri. So if if she's in this situation, I guess it's good that she's making the best out of it. But I don't know that these fun moments where they're going to parties and dancing is the only thing that's happening with them. I'm sure they're still killing and robbing people, but hopefully we'll get a little bit more of an update on Siri's situation aside from things as brief as it was in this chapter. Hopefully we'll get that soon because... We had those last two chapters in Time of Contempt that were completely following her. And now, I mean, I know this is only the third chapter into the following book, but it feels like it's been a while. It feels like we haven't really found out too much. But she just went through such drastic changes during those last two chapters of Time of Contempt that you'd think that we would get more updates. We at least want more updates. We want to see firsthand what's happening. Hopefully we get that soon. (laughs) All I can say is I hope that it happens. And in the spirit of talking about things for the future, this is usually what my closing thoughts consist of. uh, I'm going to move into my closing thoughts now. (laughs) So uh, it's not looking like the two of them, Siri and Carol, are going to be reunited anytime soon. It's just a huge bummer. Uh, He explains, and this was good uh, for context for the podcast at least because I have 
talked about this a few times and I said, I don't know exactly how far away Nilfgaard is. We're not given any maps, but he gives us, uh, Geralt gives us an idea. He says that in 12 days, in the 12 days since they left Broccolon, they have traveled 60 miles, but Nilfgaard is two and a half thousand miles away, which I think he means from where they're currently at. So 60 miles away from Broccolon. It, it, it that doesn't tell you exactly how far Nilfgaard is from any place, but I think generally speaking with the Northern Kingdoms, the places where we've spent the most time throughout the books, Nilfgaard is probably at least two to 3,000 miles away. So it's far. And they're traveling by horse where they're walking at a slow pace. Uh, it's just going to take a very long... Like there's, They're going to need some other way to get there. It, it's just... I, I, maybe they could come across a sorceress they, who can... Or a sorcerer, a, a mage, who could portal them. That would be great. I don't know that that would happen. But they just can't keep going at that rate. Because he does the math and realizes... Uh, I think he says it's a year and a half before he'll be able to get there. That's just too long. Especially with the Danger series in. It's, it's just way too long. So, either way, we know that Siri isn't with Amir. She, we know that he's not in his hands. We know that she's not in his hands. But she was somewhere within the Empire when we last got a location update on her. So, I mean, he's heading generally in the right direction. But I just... I wish that Siri could be aware of the fact that Geralt's having these prophetic dreams about her. So she could just... Uh, I don't know what she would do. Maybe, like, every... Once an hour every day, she would just randomly shout out her location <laughs> that would be very convenient for Geralt he could dream about her and the chances are pretty good that he would just happen to tune in to one of those moments where she's announcing her location randomly it might look a little bit weird to other people but it would be good to get them reunited whatever it takes I don't care it's I want I want to see them reunited again so bad but it's just it doesn't seem like that's gonna happen anytime soon I think it's probably gonna be a while and that sucks well, that's all I have for you. So, just to let you know in case you didn't, these episodes are available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcast. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining, and I will catch you all in the next episode. <laughs>